Welcome. This is the uh, 87th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And the topic this year is, is stem cells. And I'm very pleased to have with me Anne Schaefer from Mount Sinai and also Max Planck. And you have a particular interest in, in microglia. I've always thought microglia were really rather boring cells that were just simply structural elements in a brain or the glue that held the brain together. But I gather that's not re the case these days. That's, that's right. For a very long period of time, um, microglia, they are innate immune cells. So the idea was they are sitting in the brain waiting until an infection may enter and then do their job defending the tissue. And that has changed pretty dramatically, I would say, in the past really 15, 20 years, um, when it became clear that this microglia do much more than that. One of the maybe most eye-opening um, discovery was when we were able to see microglia live for the first time. And that was a back-to-back -back, back publication in Science where two photon imaging revealed that these cells are constantly moving their protrusion. Mm. So the opposite of a resting inocular cell population that's just waiting for something to happen. And there were also genetic clues as, as to the importance of, of these cells? Yeah, so this discovery that um, in the field of Alzheimer's disease, that there is a large group of mutations in genes that are associated with changing the risk to develop the disease, mm -hmm. um, affecting genes that are mainly or exclusively expressed in microglia or myeloid cells, I would say dramatically changed the field of Alzheimer's research. So almost every scientist working on Alzheimer's disease now is looking at microglia and their impact as well. And the question is, what phenotypes of these cells convey neuroprotection or neurotoxicity? Can we understand the interaction with neurons? And can we tap into the mechanism and maybe change the course of the disease just by targeting or understanding microglia? Mm. Uh, so what is known of the, of the types of interactions between neurons and, and microglia? Yeah. So microglia interact with neurons almost from the time of neurogenesis, microglia come from the yolk sac into the brain, they are from mesoderm origin, and they settle or they come into the brain the time when neurons start to be made. So neurogenesis and microglia settling in the brain occur simultaneously, mm -hmm. so from early on they are basically interacting. Um, already upon the discovery of microglia by Rio de Ortega, it became clear that they look different in different brain regions but it was not clear if that's functionally important. So in, the, in recent years, we find that microglia in different brain regions adjacent to different neurons have their unique phenotypes, their unique functions. It is uh, associated with gene expression patterns. And so from developmental, removing dying neurons, cleaning out and leaving only those neurons left behind that are functional, helping to shape the circuitries, how neurons mm -hmm. interact with each other via synapses, as well as later on what we found recently, modulating neuronal activity in an almost neuron-like fashion. All of these functions of microglia have been revealed in the, in the past few years and changed the way how we think about it. Uh, and when you say modulating, uh, do you mean in their el electrical activity? That's right. Or the That's right. It, it appears, based on research from several groups, including ours, that microglia A, have a capability of sensing neural activity, sensing changes if a neuron fires more or less, which is a remarkable feature of an innate immune cell, if you think about it. It's not electrically active by itself. Mm -hmm. So we found it can sense the release of neuromodulators or metabolites that neurons release when they become active and thereby we think almost in a pattern recognition way, which is a common way of this cell type to sense pathogens, can sense neuronal activity changes and then respond with the production of inhibitory substances and thereby puts a break onto neuron-neuron activation or neuron-neuron connections that are too active to be 
healthy, we would say. And um, what research have you been doing in particular on which aspects of these neuron microglia interactions? And we're at a stem cell meeting, so you, you're using IP in pluripotentin, pluripotent pluripotent stem cell. Yes. So, so microglia. It's a, it's a technical um, um, thing. We, we, are, we can make microglia-like cells out of hematopoietic stem cells, but that's not the real origin as we have it mm. in, in our body. Or, so there it is from a progenitor cell that is not committing er to the hematopoietic stem cell. But um, microglia by themselves are intriguing because they are slowly self-renewing in the brain. So we can actually, microglia, give rise to daughter cells that take their place. We don't fully understand yet the dynamics. Uh, different microglia divide in different speeds. We can eliminate them almost all and they can repopulate really quickly the, the brain. So they have a unique capacity to self-renew, to proliferate. And then we do see, however, that the new cells are taking exactly the same functional transcriptional profile as the previous one. So they are immediately again tuned into the right interaction with the neurons. How does this tuning happen? How does the, how does the expression profile of, the, of, a, of a glial cell in one part of the brain differ from that in another part of the yep. brain? And how do the, the two bits, parts of the brain in a sense imprint? Yep. You know, imprint what they are doing on, on CLEAR? We are working very actively on that and many people are intrigued. So there are different ideas. The most likely based on the data is that they are really instructed. They're very plastic cells. They're instructed by cues that are released by neurons. Their numbers are even regulated by a survival factor that is produced by a neuron. So the mm. neuron decides how many microglia it will have around and we can nicely manipulate that. Mm. Um, and then there are, there are intriguing um, findings. So we, we see that microglia can tune or mimic neurons in specific regions by expressing the same neurotransmitter receptor. And we don't yet understand how it happens. We know it's not a direct transfer of the neuron RNA to the microglia. Right. It acquires it by itself. It can even deplete the gene in neurons and the microglia will still show it. So. It must be cues that are instructive that we don't fully yet understand. How reversible is it known? How reversible the state of a glial cell is? So if, a glial, if you took yeah. a, a glial cell from region A and put it into region B, would it would it acquire the characteristics yeah. sort of regional region B? That's yeah. the key experiment to do. Uh, if we take adult microglia, let's say, from the cerebellum and transplant them into the striatum, would they be completely reprogrammed or do they keep a trace mm -hmm. of their regional origin? We are doing these experiments right now. They were not so easy before because the, the microglia sitting in the striatum will not allow extra microglia to survive. So we need a, a situation where we don't have microglia in the striatum mm -hmm. that uh, exists now thanks to uh, a group in Edinburgh who made a mouse that lacks all microglia. So we can do these experiments now. Based on experiments where even human IPC derived microglia like cells have been transplanted in the early mouse brain, there will be I think a lot of adaptation. It's just not clear to what extent. Mm. And it will likely happen fast. And did you just say that the Edinburgh group have a mouse with no microglia? That's right, yes. And that this mouse is presumably not very happy. It's, it's actually pretty happy. <laughs> so uh, there is a, it was, so you can, in an, in an adult brain, you can ablate all microglia and you would initially not know that this mouse has no microglia. That's very different to all the other brain cells. You cannot sure. live without neurons, oligodendrocytes or astrocytes. However, the moment you start poking this mouse, meaning yeah. stimulating the neurons, going out of a norm, yeah. that's when you can reveal the, the function of the microglia. So if we stimulate neurons in this mice by neurostimulants, the mouse will go into uh, very severe seizures, for example. Mm. So. 
to, to finish, what, what is uh, what's your dream experiment that dream. you have planned for next week? And <laughs> Dream experiments go, go way beyond that, so it's, it's much more conceptual, so I'm thinking a lot about longevity of neurons, how yeah. to keep neurons alive for very long periods of time. My favorite experiment has been done by a different group, it is transplanting neurons from short-lived animals in long-lived animals and showing the neurons are perfectly happy surviving, meaning there's no intrinsic life clock mm. on neurons meaning I could take our neurons and maybe transplant in the 400 year living Greenland shark and they would live for 400 years. So that's my well, favorite future experiment. Well, I'd prefer to do it the other way around <laughs> so that I live for 400 you years. You will, because it's your neurons eventually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the right. idea is you can, if you find the right environment, if you have the mm. right microglia around it, you may have a brain that could be living yes. extremely long so the idea is I don't, I may not need stem cells, I can actually just keep our brain live by changing the surrounding cells like the microglia and make them fully supportive. Right. Well, you need to do something about my knee as well. <laughs> the knees, that's, <laughs> not my, that's not my department. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we should finish. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you.